Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our fifth unit on heredity by discussing topic 5.4, which is not Mendelian genetics, it's non-Mendelian genetics. And what we're referring to by non-Mendelian is that, well, while Mendel's experiments were revolutionary, groundbreaking, and quintessential to the study of biology, it really doesn't explain everything when it comes to heredity and genetics and variation among organisms. Uh, we can use very, very simple examples like, you know, traits in pea plants, and, you know, we can make up a lot of different traits, but not everything when it comes to traits and characters and genes, not everything follows those rules. Life would be a whole lot simpler if it did, and it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't abide by Mendel's uh, proportions, okay? You can't do a Punnett square for everything, okay? So as I put up here, Mendel's laws and predictions work for inheritance patterns to a point. All of the characters he studied were determined by one gene, okay? So uh, if we're looking at our characteristics of the pea plants down here, um, all of these characteristics and traits were pretty much determined by one gene, and all of those genes just happen to be on separate chromosomes, which makes it really, well, relatively easy to predict um, because it'll follow a predictable pattern, you know, that 3 to 1 or the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 or the 1 to 1 ratio. Uh, the laws of independent assortment and segregation, though, those two components of the four concepts of Mendelian genetics can be applied to more complex patterns, though. All right, so what we're going to look at, we're going to look at several deviations from Mendel's model of inheritance here. Um, the, again, the law of assort, independent assortment and the law of segregation, they both apply um, throughout genetic, genetics, but not everything follows the super easy model that we were looking at um, in our last video. I'm not, not to say that, like, oh, yeah, it was so easy, because maybe it wasn't easy, but um, yeah. So these are all kind of the exceptions to a lot of the rules. All right, we're going to cover these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven today. Um, but this last one, I'd like to have a separate video on, so be prepared for that. All right, um, so the first exception to some of Mendel's experiments and Mendel's rules um, were that, you know, those pea plants, those traits that he studied, they showed what we call complete dominance, where the dominant trait always is the trait that's expressed over the recessive trait, and one dominant allele produces the dominant phenotype, and that's it. Um, but that's obviously not always the case. Thus, we have incomplete dominance, when neither allele for a character are completely dominant. Hybrids have a phenotype between the parentals. So, pretty easy example over here. We got these uh, red flowers. I, there's a particular name for them. I don't remember what they're called. Uh, we got red flowers. We got a, you know, a homozygous dominant red flower, and we got a hetero, or excuse me, homozygous recessive white flower, if we cross them, we get all heterozygotes, okay, but we get a blend, we get an incomplete dominance here, we get a blend of both parental traits in order to get pink flowers. Um, this is incomplete dominance. The white isn't dominant, the red isn't dominant, it's a blend of both, all right, that's what we call incomplete dominance, that's one exception to the rule. Um, another exception is what we call co-dominance, where two alleles affect the phenotype in separate distinguishable ways. Um, so, both alleles are expressed, okay? It's not like a mix of alleles being expressed, like an incomplete dominance. We have both alleles being expressed, and both alleles affect this, the phenotype, okay? So the example of uh, co-dominance that's most prevalent in human beings, or one of the easiest examples to discuss, is blood type. All right, so you have a, uh, three different alleles for one trait, uh, you can have the A allele, the B allele, or the O allele. And the A and the B allele are what we call co-dominant. All right, so for example, if you have blood type, or if you have an A allele from mom and an O allele from dad, you're going to have B blood type A, okay, because your, your cross is going to be AO. Same thing for B, all right? But here's the thing. If you have both the A allele and the B allele, one doesn't dominate over the other. You have what are, what's called blood type a, B, which is actually the rarest blood type as well. Um, but yeah, both of these are being expressed, and both of those affect the phenotype. Thus, the, uh, your blood type is A, B. All right? So that's co-dominance. 
Um, don't get that confused with incomplete dominance where it's kind of like a blend and, and neither trade is dominant. In this, trace, in, in this case, both uh, traits are dominant, or both alleles, I should say. Both alleles are dominant. All right, um, another example or another exception to the rule here is what we call pleiotropy, where one gene has multiple phenotypic effects. Uh, so this is, uh, this is pretty common among living things, uh, where one gene does more than one thing and produces one more than, say, one, more than one protein um, that results in more than one trait. All right, so actually there's a good example of pleiotropy in the pea plants that Mendel studied. Um, the flower color gene, the one that we looked at ex extensively um, in our last video, the purple or white flower color, is actually the same gene that determines the seed coating color. Okay, so there's a perfect example there of one gene having multiple effects on the phenotype, and that's called pleiotropy. All right, so here's a picture of it. Like one gene affects P1 and P2, so on and so forth. All right. Um, kind of similar to pleiotropy um, is what we call, well, it's not that similar. It's called epistasis, which, which is when one phenotype of one gene at one locus alters the phenotype of another gene. And I got a typo there, excuse me. Um, but yeah, this is where the one gene affects the expression of another. All right, so uh, take a look at this dihybrid cross over here. We got two mice. All right, uh, we got a positive, or excuse me, a dominant um, B allele for a black coat and a recessive allele B for the brown coat. Um, C is with pigmentation or dominant C is with pigmentation and uh, recessive C is without pigmentation. All right, and uh, if we do this cross here, okay, uh, we got two hybrids kind of like what we looked at in our last video we would expect, again, that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio um, of, say, black coat, brown coat, and albino, okay? But here's the thing. This is an example of epistasis in that the phenotype at C really kind of overcomes or it alters the phenotype at B, okay? So check out these mice here, all right? Uh, we, got, we got a heterozygous mouse, over here, we got a homozygous dominant mouse over here and a heterozygous mouse over here, all at B, okay? So we would expect all three of these to have black coats, okay? We would expect all three of these to have black coats, but none of them have black coats. None of them are going to express those, uh, or express that trait on account of the fact that they are homozygous recessive at C, okay? Which means that if you're homozygous recessive at C, you have no pigmentation if you're one of these mouse, mice, mice, that's plural. Uh, so that means that no matter what, no matter what the, uh, um, excuse me, the genotype is at B, okay, if you're homozygous recessive at C, there's no pigmentation, all right? That's an example of epistasis, overcoming one phenotype with, with another, pretty much. All right, uh, so there's a pretty good example of epistasis, and that's, uh, there's, there's other examples of that throughout the animal kingdom. I think particularly involving albinism. I think albinism is one of the big ones. Um, all right, a couple more exceptions to Mendel's rules here. We have quantitative characters and polygenic inheritance. Um, polygenic inheritance is the opposite of pleiotropy. So pleiotropy is where one gene affects multiple phenotypes, Okay, this is where more than one gene affects one single character or one single phenotype. Okay, so think about this. As I put down here, height, all right? You're not, you know, we can't do height by, or we can't predict height by doing a Punnett square. All right, it's just, it just wouldn't make very much sense. Not like there's only two heights uh, <laughs> or three heights you know, of human beings. It was like, you're tall, medium, or short. And then all the short people are all the same height, and all the medium people are all the same height, and all the tall people are the same height. So that's, it can't happen, right? So height and hair color are what we call quantitative characters, and those are characters that are varied in gradi gradations along a continuum, right? So I don't know what the shortest person in the world is, but you can be like, 
uh, or well, there's there's exceptions to that rule, but uh, e either way, you get what I'm saying. Height is based on a continuum. You could be four four foot nothing to seven six. I don't know, um, but it's you can't just do a Punnett square to solve for that kind of trait. Right, so that's what we call polygenic inheritance. And hair color is actually another example. Skin color is another example of that, although there are environmental effects of both of those, on both of those. All right, um, and the two, second to last exception that we're going to be discussing here um, is mitochondrial um, inheritance. So not everything follows Mendel's rules again on account of the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts are transmitted by egg only. So that means that your mitochondria in your cells, and you don't have any chloroplasts because you're not a plant, um, your mitochondria that you are in your cells right now are inherited from your mom. And that's how it's been. You know, everybody's, everybody's mitochondria are inherited from their mom. All right, so mitochondrial disorders, okay, if there's an affected mother and an unaffected father, all the kids are going to have whatever mitochondrial disorder this is. Um, yeah, because it's, it's passed by eggs. But if there's an affected father, okay, not going to have effect on any of the kids if the mother is unaffected. All right, so some, uh, again, mitochondrial DNA, mitochondria are all inherited just from your mom. All right? All right, last um, exception here to the rule is what we call a sex-linked gene. Um, so if you recall back to a few videos ago, we looked at the human karyotype, right? You got 23 sets of chromosomes and 22 of them are called autosomes. And another one of the pairs is called your sex chromosomes. And if you have an XX, you're biologically female. If you're XY, you're biologically male, right? Uh, so those chromosomes are not only just good for determining sex, it's good for, well, it, it has genes on it. All right, so especially the X chromosome. The X chromosome has lots of different genes on it. Um, I want to say a couple thousand, but while the Y chromosome only has like 100. But anyway, uh, so sex-linked genes are genes that are located on either sex chromosomes, X-linked or Y-linked in humans. And again, there's uh, all sorts of different combinations of sex chromosomes for animals across the animal kingdom. I think fruit flies, I think fruit flies might be XY, but... Uh, there's all sorts of different variations, but we'll just stick to humans for now. All right, sex-linked genes show different patterns of inheritance than autosomal genes. All right, and then an example of a sex-linked gene and a sex-linked gene disorder is uh, red, red-green colorblindness. It's X-linked, okay? So that means that the gene that produces, you know, normal color vision um, is located on the X chromosome. And if there's some kind of uh, mutation within that, that gene and that X chromosome, that can be inherited, right? And we can actually do a Punnett square to solve for it. Um, but it's not going to follow the normal Mendelian ratios, as we call it. All right, so if we call X sub N the colorblind gene, um, and X, you know, capital N is going to be the, uh, like, the normal sightedness, okay? And then the Y doesn't have the gene on it, all right? If we cross these, look, we get two different carriers, over here, neither of them is going to be colorblind because uh, there's one allele that is for normal sightedness. Neither of the girls, are, as you can see the XX there, are going to be colorblind. And the boys are going to be largely unaffected. Okay, so even if the, uh, even if the father is colorblind here, as we can see, XN and Y, um, the daughters might be carriers, okay, because they get an X uh, chromosome from mom and an X chromosome from dad, okay, but the males are going to be largely unaffected, okay, well, what if we cross a carrier with a colorblind male, well, then there's a 50-50 chance that the offspring are going to be colorblind, right, so there's, uh, you have one carrier female, one affected female, and one affected male over here, but uh, we got one one person over here, one guy, one male over here that isn't going to be unaffected by this. All right, uh, so that is it for this video. Okay, we're going to get into Thomas Hunt Morgan's fruit fly experiments and discuss the chromosomal basis of inheritance in our next video. All right, have a good one. See you later. Let me know if you have any questions.